Thanks so much for tuning in to this talk about collaborative research on existential types. Before we get into the details of what we're doing with existentials here, I want to motivate a little bit about why existential types might be useful. So this first example is, is I call it an object encoding. It's a way of mocking up object-oriented types in a, in a strongly typed functional programming language like Haskell. The idea here is that we can have a show all function that takes a list of this existential type. So here, each element in the list has some type A. Each A can be different, but each one has to have a show A instance. Um, in other words, each one can be rendered out to a string. Then the body of show all can, can show each element individually and concatenate all the results together. Then I can use show all on what appears to be a heterogeneous list. This three, true, and x, it's not really heterogeneous because actually each one of these has this existential type because each one of these has a show instance. Another example, let's say we want a richly typed data structure. So here we can imagine a, a data type well-typed expert, which holds abstract syntax trees for some little programming language. And we want one plus two to be a valid well-typed expert, but not one plus bool. In order to, to describe such a thing, we need to actually index the data structure with the type so that uh, the representation for true would be known to have type bool and the representation for one would be known to have type int. Then in a larger compiler, we might have a parsed expression, which is as yet unchecked, this unchecked expert, and we want to check it to form a well-typed expert. Of course, we don't know what type it's going to have until we actually check it. And so this, this checking, this is going to be, produce an existential type because I don't know what tie is going to be. Uh, so here, once again, we need an existential type. Um, another uh, related application is that maybe I already have my richly typed structure, um, but I want to perform some operation on it that means I can't really preserve my knowledge of that's encoded in the types. So if I have length indexed vectors here, n, and then later m, this is the length of a list essentially, right? I want to be able to filter that list. Well, I don't know what the output is going to be based on the input. I know this output length m has to be less than or equal to n, but that's a pretty vague relationship, right? And so I can't, say, compute the result of m just based on n. So that means that there's going to be some length of my output vector, but I don't know what it's going to be. In other words, it's going to be existentially bound. There exists a length m, but I don't know what it is. Um, the goal of this research is to make existentials as easy to use as universals. So using, basing ourselves on, on Henley-Milner type inference, right, we get uh, universals essentially for free. We get let generalization that, that peppers our code with universal quantification, and we get to specialize our polymorphic functions whenever we need to. Um, I want existentials to be, well, almost as easy. Um, Unlike with, with, norm, with, with universals, where the, all of the universal quantification is totally inferred, we're going to write the existential types in. We're not going to do some automatic equivalent of let generalizations or, 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 or corresponding idea to let generalization to get our, our existentials. Instead, we'll write them in, but we're not going to write places where we create or eliminate existentials in terms. Um, so let's dive into the filter example because we can understand more about the specific design that we're advocating here in, in this work. So we start out with our usual unary natural numbers as well as our usual length index vectors. Nothing surprising here. Um, and then we can define this filter. So this is the same filter type that we saw a few slides ago, but now we have an implementation. Um, what we see in the implementation is that there is no packing or unpacking. Despite the fact that this filter returns an existential, the first line just returns nil. I don't do any fancy footwork there. And then the recursive call to filter, again, I don't have to use any fancy footwork. The approach that we describe in, in our paper accepts this definition. Um, let's look at it a little bit more closely. The first observation I want to start here, and sort of the key thing that drives part of our design, is that filters should be lazy. The idea here is that um, in a lazy language, I might want to look at the result of filtering before I've finished actually computing the filter on all of the elements in a list. Right? If I have a list of 100 elements and I'm doing some filter, maybe I only need the first two results and I won't need any of the rest. 
If that's the case, I don't want to have to do the work of filtering all the rest of the elements. That means that filters should be lazy. One requirement for a lazy filter is that I, I can't pre-compute this recursive call. In this px line, um, right, if, if this predicate p, if that holds, I need to make this recursive call to filter. I don't want to make that recursive call until I've already set up the cons operator. Um, but this cons operator, right, this cons operator takes a vector of length n and gives us back a vector of length suck n. So it actually takes, at compile time, it takes the length of the tail. Um, we might imagine taking our nice surface language that doesn't have any packing or unpacking and desugaring it into a, a core language that does have packing and unpacking. So we might imagine taking the, the code that we have toward the top of this slide and getting the code that we have toward the bottom. On the bottom here, we have this unpack. Um, this is based on ideas from Mitchell and Plotkin from their Popple 1985 paper. We can have unpack, which we would run on this recursive call to filter that produces um, this, it's not written in the code here, but that will sort of extract out the length of this, uh, this recursive call, the length of, of that filtered um, vector, x is prime, and then it would give, make that length available for use in the, in the call to cons. This works, but this destroys our laziness. For this to work, we need to actually evaluate this recursive call before cons. That's no good. Um, this is not lazy enough. So if filter is going to be lazy, and yet cons needs to know the length of the vector's tail, then we want to get that length, we want that not to require any evaluation. After all, that length is just a compile time value. There's no reason we need it at runtime. We shouldn't have to affect our runtime evaluation in order to satisfy a compile time requirement. That's a bit backwards. Um, let's look, there's one more uh, desiderata that we want to consider in our design. And that is here I have a hidden int, right? There's the idea is, is that we have some type A, we don't know what it is, but we can project out an int from it. We can create such a thing using this function mook. So in my result here, I'm going to say hidden is mook true. So we create one of these hidden ints, and then I project out the, the int inside by using the second element of, of this tuple and applying that to the first element. I want this program to be accepted, right? There's no trouble here. And this turns out to be relatively easy. I can compile let into unpack, right? It, I can use let and say, okay, let's just take this existential. We'll make this, this, this A available inside the scope of the let. But now, suppose I want to rewrite my program by doing a little let inlining. Right? Instead of saying let hidden equals mctrue, I just want to repeat mctrue twice where I, I previously wrote hidden. That should still be accepted. I should be able to inline my lets. Yet now the unpack is much harder. It looks like I would need to insert the unpack surrounding this whole result, which now is going to affect my runtime evaluation again. So this is problematic. The key idea that unlocks are the design that we want is to not use unpack, but use another construct called open. The idea here is if I have an expression E of existential type, then open E is just the, the inner type, the, the, this type tau, where this type variable A is replaced with the existential projection of E. Right? We can almost view an existential type as a, as a dependent pair, where there's a type as well as a term that depends on that type. So here, this, these funny brackets, this existential projection is like calling first of that dependent pair. Open is like second of that dependent pair. Um, this is not a new idea. McQueen in 1986 called this witness and out instead of my funny brackets and open. Um, and Allowing, using this open construct sort of unlocks everything else that we need in order to get these lightweight existentials. So using open, existentials can now be opened anywhere. Um, I don't have to think about an unpack which then limits the scope of my existential variable. I can just call open whenever I need to. This is really important if we're going to avoid affecting runtime evaluation. 
working with an existential projection of E does not require evaluation. This step is really important, and purity is a key part of, 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 this, of the recipe here, in that if E, if let's say every time I evaluated some expression E, E might, is an arbitrary expression, it does not have to be a value. If every time I evaluated E, I might get different results, well, then we're carrying around this existential projection of E in types where it might be duplicated, well, that would no longer be sound. So purity is very, very important. Um, pack and open. I haven't mentioned pack. Pack is the way that we create existentials, and it's quite standard. Pack and open are erasable for runtime here. Uh, so that, again, means we don't change our runtime evaluation in order to satisfy compile time properties. There is a challenge here in that expressions E can appear in types. Um, because of this challenge, we need to now define what it means for expressions to be uh, equivalent when we're doing type equality. So we're, for now, we can just use alpha equivalence. It turns out a, a richer notion of equality on expressions to use face a full beta equivalence is fully compatible with our ideas, but we don't need that. Um, so for now, we'll just stick, it, we'll just stick with alpha equivalence. Um, so I've taken this idea, we've taken this idea from 1986. Why now? Why, why can we suddenly um, do this now and we couldn't do it beforehand? So there's a couple of key ingredients that all mix together very nicely. One is the setting in Haskell. Haskell gives us purity, and as we've seen, that's really important to be able to talk about these expressions that suddenly live in types and might get duplicated. We have laziness, which helps to motivate why this approach is a good idea. With these expressions in types, um, that's kind of like dependent types. So because we are more comfortable with dependent types, symbolized by this capital pi here, it means that we understand better how expressions in types might work. Um, back in 1986, this was very, very strange. And, and even then, like, the, the, uh, McQueen was unsure of the, of the wisdom of this approach. In uh, the, other, the other ingredient right now is that to make a type inference algorithm that works well, it's really nice to base it on the quick look algorithm that came from last year's ICFP. That gives us, gives us a structure by which we can easily understand how we can do um, uh, inference for, for existential. So all of these ingredients combine quite nicely. So I've talked a lot about the motivation and some user-facing features. What's the technical meat? Um, so in the paper, there's a type inference algorithm based heavily on Quick Look that elaborates into a core language built with open that is type safe. This algorithm in this language has some nice properties. So if the inference algorithm succeeds, we're guaranteed that the elaborated program is well typed and that it retains the semantics of the original program if we just erase all of our types. This algorithm is a conservative extension of Henle-Milner, meaning all of our old programs continue to type check. It's a bidirectional algorithm, and when we infer a type, that also that same type can be used in checking mode. This means we can add annotations without affecting typeability. We also have some nice properties that we can refactor our programs, reordering as existential quantification and doing let inlining without disrupting typeability. Um, interestingly, none of this was very hard to prove. The conclusion here is that by using open in our core language, we can have all these nice things. Thanks very much for watching.